Dr. Christina Kabash, um, originally from, uh, came down from Connecticut. I did my medical school at Columbia in New York City, my residency at Mount Sinai, and then my fellowship at St. Vincent's All New York City. I then practiced for uh, 12 years up in Hartford, Connecticut at St. Francis Hospital in Hartford and then moved down to Physicians Regional and my office is at the Pine Ridge uh, campus. All right. My specialty is foot and ankle, so while I'm on trauma call, I do trauma all over the body. So I'll do hip fractures, shoulders, wrists. My specialty is foot and ankle reconstruction. Can you say that a little while ago? Well, my specialty is foot and ankle reconstruction, but I do trauma all over the body. So hips, shoulders, anything broken. Uh, and with that, I'll get started. So today we're gonna to talk about advances in foot and ankle arthritis. I would say over the past five to 10 years, we've had uh, significant advances that have made both the surgeries easier, the recuperations easier, and the outcomes better. So 15% of the world is affected by arthritis. Symptoms of arthritis include swelling, pain, stiffness, decreased range of motion, and especially startup pain. That's a big one. So pain when you first get out of bed in the morning or pain after you've been sitting in the chair for a while. You know, those first few steps are tough and creaky and then as you move, it sort of loosens up. And then the more you do, the more achy it can get. Severe arthritis, so arthro is joint, itis is inflammation, so any joint inflammation is considered arthritis. Severe arthritis is when you've had longer term bony changes associated with your arthritis. And those bony changes can cause chronic pain and inability to do daily activities due to both pain and limitations in range of motion. Arthritis affects uh, about 90, one million people in the United States, and we have a population of 331 million, so about uh, one in four adults. And it's an economic burden of 304 billion, with a B, dollars per year. All right, common areas of arthritis in the foot and ankle, uh, the big toe, also known as hallux rigidus. You can see there's this area of swelling on the top of the toe, the midfoot, in the area of swelling on the top of the arch across the, the top of the foot. Progressive painful flat foot deformity, where you can see the arch is collapsing. This is from the front, and this is from the back. You can see the arch just rolling in. Oops, I lost my laser pointer. See the arch just rolling in. Uh, and the ankle. So this is a person standing, this is their normal ankle, and this is the ankle with arthritis, where you can see it's tilted out to the side and very swollen. So some of that swelling and extra width is soft tissue swelling, and some of it is extra bone formation and bone deformity from being out of place. All right, so we'll start with big toe arthritis. So that's also known as hallux rigidus, hallux limitus, or dorsal bunion. These are all common names for big toe arthritis. All right, and what's going on underneath that bump is this bone spur. So all in here is extra bone that's formed. Now you can imagine whenever that toe comes up, those bone spurs bump and limit the ability for the toe to come up and cause pinching and rubbing, and that's what causes the pain. Trauma, what causes big toe arthritis? It can have been you know, an acute traumatic incident, something where something maybe very heavy fell on the foot, where it got stuffed hard, cracked the bone, disrupted the cartilage. It can be from chronic sports injuries, whether it's football, soccer, kicking, bouncing, you know, jumping up and down on the toes, uh, and shoe wear, all right? Shoes like this, you're walking right on the end of that metatarsal head. Very common cause of that later in life. Gout is something common, tends to affect people as they get older. That causes joint inflammation, all right? And then you get deposit crystals in your joint. Those crystals erode and eat away at the smooth cartilage surface. And eventually, you're left with no cartilage in between and bone on bone. 
So these spaces between the bones aren't really spaces, okay? Those spaces are cartilage, because cartilage does not have calcium, and calcium is what's white on x-ray. That's why bones look white, because they have calcium. Mm -hmm. When the cartilage is gone, and you're bone on bone, then that's what the end-stage arthritis looks like. Mm -hmm. And of course, big toe pain in Florida, we have our mm -hmm. Florida man. All right, treatment of hallux rigidus or big toe arthritis, non-surgical treatment, NSAIDs, meaning anti-inflammatories, this would include Advil, Aleve, Meloxicam, Voltaren, Diclofenac, all right, uh, aspirin and acetaminophen are not NSAIDs, they are not anti-inflammatories. So they will not calm down, they may treat pain, but they won't treat inflammation. All right, taping to make the toe stiff and, and prevent swelling. Uh, in the past, People used to recommend getting these stiff carbon fiber insoles that you'd wear in your shoes that didn't let the soles bend. People did not tolerate them very well. They were hard, they were uncomfortable. And one of the recent non-op advances have been these wonderful cushioned rocker bottom shoes that when the big MVT, you know, good for good shoes for your thighs, well, as it turned out, it wasn't so great for your thighs, didn't do very much, but people with foot and ankle arthritis love them. All right, because now the foot and ankle didn't have to bend, you rolled through the sole of the foot. So you can see here there's a foot and there's a rocker bottom shoe. And you can see that when you walk, the foot doesn't need to bend because all of that motion can go through the sole of the shoe itself. And there's a lot of them out on the market. I mean, New Balance has them, many uh, men's and women's dress shoes and uh, activity shoes have them. So this has been huge for foot and ankle arthritis. Uh, surgical treatment, we've had a, a couple of things happen. In the old style, we would just go in and we'd say, okay, the spurs hurt if you push on them, we'll just take the spurs. Problem was, it, it didn't stop the pain that you had with the joint range of motion. It may have helped where the pain was when you pushed on it, but when the toe moved, it still hurt. So when that happened, we would go to fusion, which you could do with either plates or screws. Problem with that, toe didn't move. And when you fuse a toe, People come in, they're like, I just want to crack it. I just want to bend it, and I can't. I guess it's like an itch you can't get at. Uh, but the pain is gone. So, you know, it's, it's, these are ways that we, you know, would fuse the toe, either with screws, plates. And then when we fuse the toe, we have to make sure that we don't fuse it flat down and in line with this toe, because then you wouldn't be able to walk. We have to fuse it slightly up, so that when you walk and roll onto the ball of the foot, you don't have pain. So that toe sticks slightly up when you fuse it. So now we have some joint preserving options that we didn't have available before. So one of the things we learned is that if we just don't take the spurs from the top, but we take a wedge of bone from here, uh, in this type of arthritis, you can see here the white is cartilage, and the yellow is where the cartilage has just been rubbed raw from the bone. So you've got bare bone there. So in here, you don't just, you take the spur, but then you take a wedge out here, which opens up this space, shifts the weight bearing down to where there is cartilage, and tends to help. So this is a foot where the toe doesn't come up any further than that due to the spurs, and doesn't go down any further than that. This is after you've opened it up. This shows all the spurs on both sides, okay? This is after we've removed the spurs from the top, he still doesn't have great cartilage, and the toe comes up more, but not as much as I'd like. So we take the wedge of bone, okay? Now we've created that space. You can see we've unloaded that tight area where it rubs. So for a while, that was all we had. Sometimes we take a little soft tissue, you know, tuck it in, try to get a push in, but it didn't last long. But within the past three to five years, you see, we let go, that's where the, it would just, you know, come back to bone on bone. Within the past three to five years, a new implant's come out called Cartiva, which is like a little silicone nubbin. And we can put that little silicone nubbin into the, the big toe, and it maintains that space that we created. And now the toe moves and glides, there's no rubbing or creaking or grinding because bone isn't rubbing on bone anymore. So this, this has done really well. So I would say many toes that we would have said, okay, you've got to fuse, now we're not fusing. So people can do yoga, push-ups, Pilates, pickleball, you know, things on the ball of their forefoot that you can't you know, necessarily do if your toe is fused. All right, midfoot arthritis. Yeah. What about implants? 
Well, it isn't in plant, technically. Okay, I mean, in that be like joint, uh, So joint replacements and the big toes don't work very well. There'd be a lot of, I know a lot of podiatrists that'll do them. I don't know any orthopedic surgeons that'll do them. Okay. So when you think about joint replacements, you know, the ones that typically are in the knees or the shoulders, they're actually loaded, okay? On the, the foot, they're loaded this way. So there's a lot of shear stresses. So here, when they're actually loaded, the joint, everything's compressed. In the toe, when it's on the side, you're constantly shearing it instead of compressing it. So they tend to loosen, uh, they tend to still be painful. Hmm. So I'm not a fan of the joint replacements in the big toe. Sometimes they work well, but when they don't work well, it's an issue. All right, so back to the picture of midfoot arthritis, which again, that bump, and now of course we know that bump is inflammation of the joint and most likely a bone spur. All right, so in this case, there's the bone spur. All right, not off treatment. Again, anti-inflammatories, ice, activity modification, anything that creates stress or pressure on that will make it worse. If it's hurting you, you're hurting it. All right, anything orthopedic, that's a, that's a guideline. If it's hurting you, you're hurting it. We can do injections, those tend to work well. And there are many patients that have arthritis and I'll do two or three injections a year and we manage them that way for years. Rock or bottom shoes, again, it takes the stress off those joints having to move and be loaded. Those do very well. Uh, and in the past, we would do uh, fusions uh, this way, okay, where we had plates and tons of screws and all kinds of metal and hardware in there, okay? But recently, they've come out with these new memory metal, which I use now instead, which is a lot faster procedure, so there's less operative time, and there's also a lot less hardware in the foot. And what's unique about it is that it's a, a staple that goes in straight, and then as soon as you take it off the inserter, it compresses, so it provides continuous compression across the joint surface, a lot of stability, and if I need more stability, I add a few more legs. And it's made of something called nitinol, which, is, which stands for nickel, Ni, titanium, and the uh, scientific group that discovered it, the Naval Ordnance Laboratory. Apparently they discovered the metal and this, these properties when they were uh, building things that could dismantle magnetic mines. So that was pretty cool. All right, progressive painful flat foot. This causes a lot of arthritis. As we get older, our feet get longer and wider, okay? Our feet, are, I'm sure if you think when you were in your 20s and 30s and you think of your feet now, everybody's feet have gone up a size, and you know, maybe a width as well. So what's happening, our feet aren't growing. What happens is that as we get older, the arches collapse, and as the arches collapse, the foot lengthens and spreads, okay? Now, if the arch collapses too fast, the, arch, the whole ankle can start to roll in, and there can be the, the joints that aren't moving in the normal way, so they rub differently, and they develop arthritis. So. This is an example again of the arches rolling in and just being flat, flat. So what can progress this? Sometimes people have a perfectly nice foot when they're standing, but when they walk, the arch rolls in. You've all heard the term pronators, right? Okay, so what's happening when you're pronating is that as you're pushing off, the ankle is rolling in and this strains the tendon that supports the arch. And when that tendon goes, the arch collapses and there's not much you can do. How do you know if you're a pronator? Because it's hard to look at yourself when you're walking. If you have a callus on the inside of your big toe right here, chances are you're a pronator because as you're walking, the foot is rolling in and as it rolls in, then you push off at the inside of your big toe. All right, a normal foot, weight bearing. You can see the arch goes like this. And on a flat foot, kind of the reverse, okay? so. It goes. That's what we mean by arch collapse. It really collapses. Okay, the other thing with flat foot is that if it happens on one side and not your other side, it actually creates a leg length discrepancy. So if you look at this x ray, all right, this is the close up at the ankles. And if you look, you can see one ankle here is higher than the other ankle there. Okay. So now let's go to the hips as a result of that, and you can see if you go up to the top of the x-ray of the hips, the whole pelvis is tilted. 
So when you have a leg length discrepancy because one arch collapsed and the other hasn't, that's going to put strain on your knees, your hips, and your lower back. So very important to get that corrected. All right, early treatment of a flat foot while it's still flexible before it's become stiff, rigid, and arthritic is to get an arch support in. So this is without the arch support, and then this is with the arch support. Okay, again, the arch support. Sometimes an arch support isn't enough, and there's just too much force, and there's no orthotic that's going to correct it. If, as long as there's no ankle arthritis, and it's just uh, foot arthritis and inflammation, a brace like this is called a Vinci brace. It's hinged at the ankle, it goes in a sneaker, and you can play tennis, you can jog, you can do everything in it. So you can still be very active without injuring or damaging your foot further. If it goes on to rigid arthritis, then unfortunately you need a more, if you don't want to do surgery, then you need to do a more uh, rigid type treatment. This is like a leather brace that either laces up or Velcros up. Some people need the Velcro because they can't use the laces because of their fingers but it doesn't allow your ankle to move. So it's hard to be active in a brace like this. So it's better to catch it early. Surgery, if you want to fix the arch collapse and not wear a brace, as long as you don't develop any arthritis in the foot, there are surgeries that we can do where we shift bones, move tendons, so that you maintain range of motion in all of your foot, okay? Once you have arthritis though, range of motion hurts, and then we have to fuse the foot. So we don't fuse the ankle. The ankle still goes up and down. We just fuse the arch so that it's not that flat as painter's collapse. There haven't been a lot of uh, advances in either of these. It's sort of the same tried and true surgeries we've probably been doing for at least 20 to 30 years, but they work well. And finally, the last topic, ankle arthritis. Okay, so here's a picture again. Here's the normal ankle, and here's the arthritic ankle. All right, what causes ankle arthritis? So unlike knees and hips, where most of the arthritis is genetic, you can sit on the sofa your whole life and still develop arthritis. In the ankle, the majority of arthritis that we see tends to be following trauma. Very few people get primary ankle arthritis. In fact, only about you know 10% of the population, or 10% of the ankle arthritis population. So what happens when you have trauma? Well, as you can see, here's the, the joint surface. It's been broken into a lot of pieces. It's irregular. We go in and we do our best to try to you know, put it together and make it anatomic. But even small microscopic differences are going to create differences of unloading and, and stress at the joint and go on to break down the cartilage. So again, white cartilage is a smooth fighting surface. And then in normal cartilage, these fibrils are packed really tight and they hold uh, moisture and water and give a nice, plump, smooth, firm surface. As those fibers, uh, fibers uh, pop, uh, break down, they become looser, they don't hold water well, and eventually they can crack and shear and bone is exposed. All right. Joint destruction can also come from inflammatory arthritis. So people who have rheumatoid, gout, infection, lupus, Lyme, anything that causes a lot of inflammation in the joint can also break down cartilage. Because when your white cells go there, which is inflammation, they shoot out the digestive enzymes that would be killing foreign bodies or bacteria, not realizing that there aren't any to your own tissue. All right, and then 9% of our ankle arthritis is primary, meaning genetic. Like if you did nothing, you would still get it. Again, symptoms of arthritis, aching, swelling, grinding, creaking, locking, uh, stiffness, and morning and startup pain, classic sign. All right, age distribution of ankle arthritis. Um, at presentation, most people are usually in their like 50 to 70 when it shows up. So arthritis, again, arthro is joint, itis is inflammation. So the first uh, stage is just inflammation of the joint, the capsule, the cartilage. Uh, over time, the cartilage then begins to break down. Okay, when it breaks down, you can see, again, the cartilage is white, you get areas where it's denuded from bone, you get the bone cracks, you can get bleeding, okay, from the cracked bone. Uh, you can get cysts under the bone, so when the bone has a crack in it, okay, the, the joint fluid from the joint gets pressed through the crack and erodes and makes that cyst underneath, just like a pothole, okay? So up north, 
You get cracks in the pavement, water gets under the pavement, it erodes the ground away from under the pavement, and the pavement collapses. That's the exact same thing that happens in your knee, your hip, your ankle. You get bone spurs when joints get arthritic, and they have all this uh, like bleeding and inflammation. No matter what joint it is, your body forms spurs around it to try to stiffen it up. So your body is actually trying to fuse it on its own. Well, fortunately, those spurs hurt and they block motion. So here's an ankle that has big spurs right up here in the front. Okay, so this is where the bone should stop, and all of this here is extra bone, both on the tibia and then both on the talus. So whenever that foot comes up, you can imagine those spurs hitting and hurting. All right, and that decreases your range of motion and eventually causes deformity. So over time, this is an ankle you can see the whole ankle has just eroded up into the tibia and it's tilted off to the side. Oops. And that's this person here. This is this ankle, this x-ray. Okay, non-operative treatment of ankle arthritis, rest, you know, low impact activity, and you want to avoid anything that's putting extra impact stress and pressure on the joint. So when you do have arthritis, you can still do slow loading exercises. So we call closed chain, where your feet are on the ground and you're slowly loading and lifting, you can do that. What you don't want to do is anything where you're jumping up and down and pounding. That will accelerate arthritis and pain. Ice helps uh, break inflammatory reaction. When the inflammation is down, you can use heat to warm it up. So I'd like to say when your, your joint is hot and inflamed, ice it. When it's uh, stiff and cold, heat it up to warm it up and get it going. So heat it up and cool it down. Compression, swelling itself hurts. So if you can help prevent all the swelling and inflammation and edema that comes with arthritis, you're going to feel a lot better. So compression socks, compression elastic braces, anything to counteract and push that fluid back out of the, the area. Anti-inflammatories work well, but you don't want to be on them chronically. And then various uh, bracing, anything that helps restrict the range of motion and the irritation at the joint. And of course, came with rolling knee walkers. Rolling knee walkers are huge. So that's, that's another non-op advancement along, I, one of the big ones, along with the rocker bottom shoes, rolling knee walkers have really helped people get around after foot and ankle surgery. It's the, the scooters, I wish I had brought a picture, but you put your knee on it, you hold on to the handlebars so you can get around. They go in and out of cars like strollers, so you're not, it, it really gives you your mobility back. Because after four, you forget crutches. Very difficult. All right, so anti-inflammatories, offloading. All right, arch supports, rocker bottom shoes. Again, so you can see there's a theme here, right? Thanks for non-operative treatment. Bracing, taking it easy. Okay, and then operative treatments. So arthroscopy has had a lot of advancements uh, recently. Uh, fusion, we've had some advancements, and ankle replacements are, are really beginning to pick up steam and are showing a lot of promise. So ankle arthroscopy can treat early stages of cartilage of, of uh, ankle arthritis. So Basically, when you still have a lot of inflammation of the capsule and little capsule tears, it can go in and, and scar in the capsule. It can go in and clean those up. Small cartilage lesions. So sometimes when you sprained or injured your ankle and you knocked off a piece of cartilage and you have bare bone there, that hurts. We can go in and we can fix that. And when there's bone spurs blocking motion, we can fix that. So, but you don't, so it's, here's an example with the, again, the bone spurs in the ankle. So here's the bone spurs in the front. We can remove them. You can see how if you try to bring the ankle up, these two spurs would hit. This is the ankle after the spurs have been removed. So that ankle can now move up and down without being blocked. But you can imagine if you had a lot of arthritis in the joint and you increase the range of motion, you would actually make the pain worse. You would increase your range of motion, but now you're moving a joint which your body was trying to lock up for a reason, and it can actually be more painful. So you have to get it before you get the cartilage issues. So again, that's the pre, so, so with the bone spurs and without the bone spurs. So how do we do it? So basically when we scope, we make two tiny incisions in the front of the ankle. All right, one is for the camera, 
and then one is for the shaver or burr or biter or whatever we need to clean up on the inside. So this is that same spur from that x-ray, okay? You can kind of see the outline here inside the ankle. All right, this is the spur on the other side so that when it moves, the two spurs hit, and I have a picture of that. Okay, so there's the spur and there's the spur. Now we're gonna start moving the ankle up and down. And you can see how those two spurs have just been knocking into each other. Okay, so. There's the spur. This is Arthrex, our, our wonderful company down here in Naples that I, I love, I feel proud <laughs> that it's down here. Um, so we take, it's got a little burr and then we go in and we remove, there's the spur, and then we remove most of it at this point here. And then we go to the other side and get the spur on the other side. And when hairs are moving out, the ankle moving, and the spurs are no longer bent. Okay, and this, you can see this ankle still has a good cartilage surface, so it's going to glide and do well without pain now. Okay, same photo. All right, so cartilage lesions. So as you get ankle arthritis, again, you can uh, get inflammation. So this is, look, this is what the good cartilage looks like on this side, okay? And this is the cartilage that's breaking down. You can see it looks all... Uh, soft, irritated, red, angry. Okay, so we would go in with a shaver and we would remove that soft cartilage before it started to peel off and become unstable and create big holes with exposed bone underneath like this. All right, once we have bare bone though, your body can't heal anything. It can't grow things on the outside of the end of the bone. So what we have to do is we take what's called a little pick and we poke holes in it until we get bleeding. And then once you have bleeding, the body can come and it can make something called fibrocartilage. We can't grow articular cartilage, not in the lab, not uh, in, the, in the body, but we can grow fibrocartilage, which is like a scar cartilage, which is, is better than having nothing. And people do tend to do very well with it. Sometimes those holes though are too big, right? You just microfracture, there's just, you're not gonna be able to grow enough to fill in that pothole, right? Here's an example here. So when that happens, what we can do now is we can take cartilage from the knee, which I'm not a fan of, okay, but that was something we used to do because why take a perfectly good joint and ruin it for another joint? Or there's now a lot of options of donor cartilage. So you can get juvenile cartilage where they've like grown it up in a lab, and again, it's never gonna be as good as yours or you can get donor cartilage that's been processed so that it's free dried and all the building blocks for your body to help heal are there. So that's what I tend to use the most. So again, here's the lesion. Here's the particulated donor cartilage that we place in the base. And then this is one that we actually opened up. So right in here, so white is the cartilage. This area right in the middle here is where they lost the cartilage because we couldn't get to this spot with the scope. All right, so again, here's the area here. And what we did is we made it a bleeding bone base. We put donor bone graft in there, closed it up, and uh, we were done. Okay, so what do you do with end-stage ankle arthritis? Where you can't go in and scope it, you can't do little cartilage transplant procedures. And the question is to fuse or not to fuse. Mm -hmm. That is the question. So ankle arthrodesis or fusion versus ankle arthroplasty. So this is an ankle replacement and this is an ankle fusion, all right? So an ankle replacement, just like a, a knee, a shoulder, a hip, you have metal on each side of the joint and then between in the joint space, we don't have cartilage, instead we have a plastic insert, a polyethylene insert, which provides cushioning and a smooth gliding surface. So ankle fusion for years and years was the gold standard, right? You had ankle arthritis, you fused it, okay? 90% of people had good or excellent results in 10 years. Okay, that's pretty good, all right? Um, provides reliable relief of pain, returned activities of daily living, all right? But, so when would I recommend an ankle fusion, okay? So somebody who has a lot of bone loss, they're not gonna do well with a replacement. If they have a lot of deformity, then also they're gonna have bone loss.
collapsed, they're not gonna do well with the replacement and the ligaments aren't balanced anymore. So if you put a replacement into something that was tilted for a long time, chances are the ankle's gonna wanna go back that way. If there's ever a history of infection, you uh, would never wanna do an ankle replacement. And believe it or not, people who are very active, you wanna fuse it and not replace it. So somebody who is 40 and below, uh, who plays a lot of tennis, who's an outdoor laborer, who's a, uh, a cyclist, who's gonna put a lot of stresses on that ankle, you're gonna wanna fuse it. So the ankle replacements actually do best for people who are in their like 50s and, and 70s, who just wanna get out there, they wanna walk, they wanna play bocce, they wanna maybe do you know, an occasional jog, but they aren't gonna be hardcore running tennis, pickleball, I mean, you can do it, I don't recommend it, with an ankle replacement. Uh, <clears throat> and the other problem with an ankle fusion is that while 90% have good to excellent results at 10 years, at 20 years, 50% have gone on to develop arthritis in the adjacent joints. Because what happens is when the ankle doesn't move, all the joints around it have to try to absorb that motion and those stresses. So then what used to be ankle arthritis turns into talonavicular arthritis, subtalar arthritis, TMT arthritis. So that's one of the, the risks of the fusion, you know, if you're really gonna use that foot. Additional risks of ankle fusion, the bone doesn't heal, you have painful scar at the sites, and people always worry about an altered gait. And I, I think ankle fusions are great. I do more ankle fusions than I do replacements, okay? And people worry about how they're gonna walk. Okay, so this is an ankle fusion I did. And tell me which ankle was fused. And again, she's somebody younger, so we did a fusion. And that's actually me standing at the end there many years ago. <laughs> <laughs> All right, can you even tell which ankle is fused? Oh. No, exactly. Yeah. And people really worry about that. So I have some clues for you, okay? These are the ankles. You might know which one now because of the scar. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that's the motion, okay? Because those are the joints around the ankle that are moving. Mm -hmm. Okay, because your foot had lots of joints in it. So you can see the left isn't quite making as big circles as the right, but there's still a lot of motion there. Okay, and that's point up and down. There's, you know, some motion. So this is another case of a fusion. Okay, this is a woman who's of severe arthritis and deformity in the right foot. So for her, we fused it with uh, we <clears throat> what's called a nail. So it used to be nails were only used in like tibias and long bones, and then we kind of figured out that we can use them for very severe deformities and ankles as well. All right, and that's the right which was fused. So this was her before, and this is her now. So she hasn't walked in two years. And these are pretty satisfying cases. And again, you can see with if fused, you know, it's not, not that abnormal a gait. So when don't you want to fuse? If anybody's ever had vascular disease, if they're currently infected, if they can't be non-weight bearing for six weeks of the healing period, or if they have poorly controlled diabetes, all of those are no-nos for doing any type of fusion or total ankle replacement surgery. All right, open ankle fusions, like the one you saw before, or this one for severe deformity or bone loss, we fix them with plates, screws, nails, rods. All right, I actually did a teaching video for AL, which is our worldwide orthopedic teaching organization on uh, open ankle fusions. All right, and then the advances in ankle fusion, though, have really come using, again, arthroscopy. So we can go in now with the scope clean up the joint, get rid of all the cartilage, create fresh bleeding bone on either side, and then percutaneously put screws in. And again, I did a teaching video on that as well. So these are some of the images from it, where we're finding where to put the portals, okay? So that this is the wire, where the portals are gonna go, it's giving us access to what's left of the joint. Then we go in with the scope, we clean away any, this is bare bone, this is remaining cartilage, we clean that out because we have to have two bleeding bone surfaces. This is a little burr, and we're going in and again cleaning away uh, any of the outside bone to get into the inner bleeding layers of bone. 
because bleeding bone can heal the bleeding bone. All right. This is checking that we like the alignment in the OR. All right, so I'm, I'm happy with this alignment. Then we take the guide wires that we put across the ankle where we want the screws to go. All right, and then we put the screws in right over the wires. So very small incisions, and there's a lot less morbidity, a lot less pain, and the fusion rates are actually better. The surgery itself takes a little longer because you know it's a little more delicate, a little more small, but they tend to do, people tend to do very well with it. All right, but sports. So what can you do after your ankle is fused? 94% of people return to golf, all right? 77% will return to skiing, and that's downhill, not cross country, because you're in a nice high ski boot in downhill. 38% tennis, jogging, running, football, soccer, 12 to 25%, but no professional athlete has ever returned to sports after an ankle arthrodesis. So, you know, there's, your motion is never gonna quite, and strength, they're never gonna quite be the same. Okay, total ankle replacement. So the ideal patient, older, thin, low demand, uh, 50s to 70s. There's, when total ankle replacements first came out, they failed miserably. We had our first generation, they didn't really last. We had our second generation, they didn't really last. We're now on our third generation. And we're at a 10 year point in a lot of our third generations and what we're finding is that we're having like an 80 to 90% retention rate at 10 years and people are active and healthy and getting back to their lives. So, <coughs> there's five designs approved in the U.S. The Salto Tolaris is the one that I use. One called Integra, one called a Star, and one called a Zimmer, and then one called an Inbo, which is really, for me, I would never ever use this as a primary because it takes a lot of bone in. It's a, it's a big hunk of metal. Uh, the advantages of total ankle replacement is if you don't get adjacent joint arthritis because you maintain motion at the ankle so you're not stressing the adjacent joints. This is the old like walking labs looking at all the different muscle firings and you know comparing. Uh, you have a better range of motion and a more normal gait. All right, the risks of an ankle replacement is that you may need additional surgeries. You may develop some spurs around that ankle uh, joint and you may have to go in and clean them up. All right, when you put the metal in, you could get stress fractures around it if the bones become soft from not having you know, been used or normal load bearing over many years. Uh, you may be stiff. So if the ankle didn't really move before surgery, there's a chance that the ankle's not really gonna move after surgery because those muscles haven't worked in a long time and there's a lot of stiff scar around the joint that's just not stretchy enough to allow motion. And there's the risk that the prosthesis can become loose. So and that's what loose means. So the bone kind of gets eroded, there's inflammation, and then it collapses and the prosthesis shifts. So this would be <coughs> a bad thing. All right, this, this is the one that I use, the Salto Tolaris. You know, we now have some good 10-year follow-ups. You know, we have these 16 patients, 95% have retained their prostheses and are doing well. All right, there's a number of studies for the other prostheses as well, so you're seeing anywhere from like 85, 90%. And with the, the salt and chili, that's 95. So here's a, a patient that I did, this was her pre-op, okay, so she doesn't have a lot of deformity, everything's still in good alignment, but she has definitely lost that cartilage interval, there's, there's nothing there. Okay, so this is the incision you make to do it. Okay, and this is the jig that goes on the front of the ankle. And this is you know, what it looks like if you were looking at it uh, from a picture. Again, this is the jig. This is removing bone to put the metal and plastic pieces in. The exposure, this is putting the triads in. All right, and then once we've done all that, here's what it looks like in the picture, and here's what it looks like in real life. All right, one year post-op. This is the right ankle, this is her. Okay, and again, this is the one we did the ankle replacement and this one needs to be done too. So you wanna do one at a time? Whatever, that video doesn't show, but she had a very normal gait. So in summary, ankle arthritis can be anywhere from mild to end stage. 
right? There's operative and non-operative treatment options for both. Early stage arthritis can be treated with uh, debridement, cartilage restoration techniques, and with the, the scoping and the microfracturing and the cartilage implants. End stage ankle arthritis can be ankle fusion or ankle replacement. We do know that young active patients do better with fusion. So someone who says, I'm, I love my pickleball, I need to get out there and play pickleball and tennis, then I would say fusion. Uh, there's no gold standard in older, more sedentary patients. Both work well. Uh, again, with ankle fusion, motion is lost with the risk of adjacent joint arthritis, but less risk of revision surgery. With ankle replacement, motion is maintained, but you do have a higher risk of maybe needing to go in and fix a little few things here and there. So just remember, when you break down, whoops, call the tow truck. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, does anybody have any questions? 